So welcome everybody. Um, I want to welcome everybody to a year and a half of uh, Sunday mornings with Twitchy Women. We're having a great time. And today we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Carrie Bryant, who has founded a company called Guide Beauty. And let me pick that, let me go to the next slide. And let me tell you a little bit about Carrie, one second. Okay, so um, many of us take our abil abilities for granted and it can be easy to overlook how having steady hands makes everything from making lunch to applying makeup super easy. Uh, but our ability to flick on an eyeliner wing, paint on eyebrows, hair by hair, or even comb mas mascara through, through our lashes could one day change. And that's what happened to makeup artist, Carrie Bryant. While working on a photo shoot about 10 years ago, she could feel something wasn't right. At this point, she'd been working in the beauty industry for more than 10 years and applying makeup is almost like a reflex for her. Yet the model in her makeup chair that day took far longer to complete than usual. I didn't know why, but I kind of ignored it and similar things were happening to my body along the way, she said. Five years later, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And as soon as she received the diagnosis, she feared she might completely lose her ability to apply makeup through the shaking hands. And we all know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. um, so she didn't want to let this go. This was her livelihood. She'd been doing it for years. It was her creative outlet. So what she did was re rethought the tools that she used to apply makeup. And uh, many of her traditional tools weren't providing the stability she needed. And she knew that she had to do something. So she started meeting with ergonomic experts and developed her own tools, which she will, you can see on the screen here. Uh, I am really want to see how she uses these. I am fascinated by this. So her research and dedication resulted in Guide Beauty, her new cosmetics brand. And it's not just a makeup band brand, it is also dedicated to makeup education and expanding the idea of how makeup tools should work. So with that, I'm going to turn off my screen share and I'm going to welcome Terry and I'm gonna pin you on here. Um, where did she go? <laughs> Start talking and I'll find you. Oh, there you are. There you are, okay. <laughs> All right, let's pin Terry. Okay, there we go. So Terry, um, yeah. why did it take you five years to get a diagnosis? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it, looking back it, it, now to me, it seems so obvious, uh, but in the beginning, you know, and maybe there were moments even prior to 11 years ago, but in the beginning, my symptoms presented, I had rigidity in my arm and there was pain and it wasn't moving as well. Uh, and then I would have those moments where I'd be on set and I would be doing somebody's makeup. And I used to say, I, I was a left-handed makeup artist. I used to say that I would look at somebody when they were in my chair. I knew how I wanted to celebrate their features and that my arm and my hand were just this very direct extension of my mind's eye. This was the tool, whatever you put in it, I could just make it happen. But there were these moments starting 11 years ago where I would be on set and I, these techniques, it always came so easily to me. Just, it wasn't happening. It was taking me a long time. Um, and I was going to doctors, I was asking, and I was getting a lot of, well, you're getting older, and you probably don't drink enough water, and are you exercising, and, you know, maybe no cocktails at night, which I'm, that one was a, a hard no for me, but <laughs> um, I just, you know, so you kind of accept it, I think, because, uh, you know. Nope. I, I just unmuted, uh, unmute yourself. I just muted you by accident. Sorry. Can everybody, un everybody mute themselves? I forgot to tell you to do that ahead of time. Should I go back a little bit? Where did I lose you? No, go back. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, I, oh, so, so I'll just, I mean, in, I think in the beginning, you know, the symptoms presented and I was in felt some pain and my arm was tightening and my hands just weren't quite working properly. And I didn't know what was going on, but I was asking people and they were really, you know, I was going to doctors and they were just saying things like, well, you're getting older and you probably don't drink enough water. And are you getting enough sleep? And what kind of exercise are you doing? And how many drinks do you have a night? And 
you know, it's frustrating that people aren't taking you seriously, but at the same time, that sounded better than somebody telling me something was terribly wrong with me too, right? So, um, you know, I accepted it. And then throughout the years, you know, the symptoms started to, to get more advanced and they were progressing. Um, and then I was going back to more doctors and kind of getting the same response. Um, at some point though, I think, you know, again, it's sort of this balance of, you know, I, I don't want to be ignored. I want people to take me seriously, but all right, at least I'm not getting this bad diagnosis. At some point I was with a physical therapist. Um, I had gone to see a doctor and he said, you just, you're just not in great shape. We're going to send you to a, a, a physical therapist. And I was working out with them. They were stretching me one day that person was gone and his replacement was with me for about I kid you not, like two minutes, she started to stretch my arm out and she said, would you excuse me for a moment? And apparently her husband is a neurologist and she called him and said, I have this, this client, this patient here and I think something's not quite right. And she said, I don't wanna make panic you, but I, I really feel like this is not just a moment where you need somebody to help you stretch and do a little bit more exercising. I think you should go see a neurologist. That neurologist, uh, again, in about two minutes sort of did the thing like walk, walk for me, uh, you know, do this with your hands, uh, you know, to kind of move your fingers and said, um, yeah, I think you have Parkinson's. And after, you know, 11 years, uh, you know, of, of, after all those years of not knowing, or sorry, at that point, six years, it was like in a split second, all of a sudden somebody was saying, I actually know what it is right now. Uh, and I said, you know, he obviously couldn't confirm it, but he said, I'm, I'm, Pretty sure this is what's going on and i said well if you were a betting man like how, how sure are you thinking what doctor is going to you know do that answer but he did he said i, I i'm going to get like one to ten i'll give it a nine that's how sure i am he sent me for the mri sent me for the dat scan i ended up going to, to shans to see a specialist and they confirmed it um and so yeah i think i just think that you know, part of it was that nobody was taking me seriously. The other thing to mention is that my career kind of allowed me to ignore it a little bit because not only was I working all these years as a makeup artist, but I was developing education programs for, for cosmetic companies. So, um, you know, I was doing, I wasn't taking as many jobs on set. So if you called me for fashion week where it was a lot of models in the chair in and out, uh, and I just knew for some reason I wasn't gonna be able to handle it, I would say no to that job. But if you called me maybe for a one day shoot with one model and I thought, well, maybe I could manage that one. But as I was shifting away from working on set, I was still able to develop those education programs. So, um, you know, I was kind of pivoting my career a little unknowingly uh, because something was enough was going on with me that uh, I had no other option. Uh, you know, and the, the last push was, you know, I was very sad that I was losing my ability to do makeup on others. But six years ago, I, that you know, that uh, loss actually progressed enough that I wasn't able to do makeup on myself, um, and I was having struggles there. And I, at that point, I was really starting to, to think something's got to be got to be wrong. So that was a, a, a long-winded answer and all sorts of, of, of uh, you know different paths. But I think there's just a lot of contributing factors, especially when people don't take you seriously. Okay, so tell us about your cosmetic line. And so, why, where, where are you, um, what changes did you have to make in the actual formula to make it work? Yeah, so it was a moment, you know, I, I uh, always say that the day I started Guide Beauty was the, you know, the day I got my diagnosis, because I ran home with sort of tunnel vision thinking now I need to, now at least I know what's going on, right? Before I had no idea. So I had to let go because I didn't know why I couldn't do my makeup as well. Um, but now if there's an answer in front of me, maybe I can solve for it. So I started to take apart, you know, I know the mechanics of good artistry. So I started with, I took a toolkit, I took my makeup, my brushes, my handles, my creams, my formulas, and started to pull them apart and piece them back together, trying to figure out if there was a way I could rework it so I could actually apply makeup like I used to. So I wouldn't at least lose the, the skill set completely. Um, and I think intuitively I was starting to understand some of the issues I was having. A lot of it came down to grip and stability. And so, um, you know, and those were starting, sort of the, the factors, the human factors that I started to sort of piece into the components themselves. Um, and because the small sort of changes I was making on my own was making such a big difference, I ended up hiring a design team uh, and an engineering team that specialized in something called human factors engineering. And they introduced me to something called universal design, which I think is unbelievably fascinating and a brilliant approach when you're designing anything. 
because really it, it sort of it, it's built on the premise that you, when, you, when you consider and factor in for those who have the greatest need, you ultimately create a, a better product and solution for the whole, right? And so we pulled in over 200 test users. We started watching people apply traditional makeup and we looked sort of to find those human factors. And so anywhere we could, we started to build into the tools themselves a easier grip, more stability, things that help guide the hand in application so you can get the results you're looking for. And I'm certainly happy to, when, when we start playing, I can sort of show you what that looks like. Okay. And you had to reformulate the, the cosmetics themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've, everything. I mean, this was a, a three-year development process. You know, when you start and you're doing everything, you know, normally when I was doing this for other companies, you go and you pick a sort of, there's, there's a beautiful world of compacts and tools and you pick one, you may make a little bit of an adjustment to it and then you put your deco on it and you're done, but we were doing everything custom. So because the tools changed, the formulas had to change as well because they partner, they work together. So our eyeliner formula is, is not, uh, it's a different texture than maybe some of the more traditional creams and gels you might have used. Um, the mascara has almost a, a little bit of a wetter feel than maybe some traditional mascaras because it's meant so that if you don't have a lot of control or, or you don't have a strong enough hand to really work through lashes, which is what traditional mascaras have you do, that just a, the lightest touch, the mascara will wrap around those lashes and do the work for you. So we had to be thoughtful and mindful when we were creating both products uh, in, in terms of the tools you use to apply it and the textures and the formulas that you were applying them with. Okay. And you didn't use any animals? No. <laughs> no, 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 no animal testing. Uh, completely, that was the big one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, uh, vegan as well, cruelty free vegan. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we, there's actually, you know, there's just never a need for animal testing in the cosmetics industry, as I know you, you know, Sharon. Um, it, you know, maybe in other, in, in, in other worlds, but in ours, they have in vitro testing, they have human testing. So the animal testing just isn't, it isn't needed and it doesn't, it just shouldn't happen at least. But that's my two cents. And where are, where do you have the cosmetics, the form, have them made? Yeah, so I thought this was interesting. Yeah, so um, our, our, our labs that we, so we have a, a, an in-house chemist who is in Florida where I am as well. Uh, we have two labs with the, and we work with the chemists at those labs. One is in Canada, in Toronto, and the other is in New Jersey. And then our components are manufactured in China and then shipped here to the labs and we fill them here in either, here when I say here, either in the US or in Canada. And um, I think that's it for my questions. So okay. uh, other than where you can buy, I guess we can only buy them online at the moment. Yeah, at the moment. So uh, when we launched, <laughs> I launched the brand, I went to still, whatever, I guess it's two years ago now, almost. Uh, I went to New York to you, you'd go on a big press trip, right? You meet with the beauty editors. Um, and uh, that was about two weeks before the pandemic shut everything down. So at that point we said, okay, we're gonna be a direct to consumer brand. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we're not gonna to go to the retailer, that's not happening. Um, so, you know, you, again, you pivot in life, right? You never knew this was coming. Um, in some ways it actually has, um, it's actually been somewhat of a gift because I think it's not that, well, not that I wanted the pandemic to happen, but um, we all kind of had to slow down a little bit. And I think people were more interested in taking the time to talk and try to connect in a way that maybe they wouldn't have before. And this is a new way to apply makeup. So it, it requires some learning and some education and some time spent um, to sort of for people to sort of look and understand why change may be necessary. So I think, um, you know, at the time I thought this was the worst thing that could happen to the business, but it actually, you know, in some ways was uh, probably one of the best things that could have happened for the business, um, at least in terms of that. So we are direct to consumer. So it's guidebeauty.com. We're on Vera Shop, uh, but uh, you know that may be we may be opening up distribution, um, you know, in the near future. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and start your demo. And if yeah. anybody has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And if it's an appropriate time, I will ask ask Terry. Otherwise, we'll hold them until she's finished, and we'll ask all the questions. Yeah, so jump on in whenever you want. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about grip and stability, and I, I'm sure you can kind of identify, and, and at least for me, my hand, so I'm a left-handed artist, people used to say to me, well, and that was where my symptoms presented on the left side, so. 
would didn't that work out well? Um, so, so people will just come say, well, why don't you use your right hand? I don't, I'm not a right-handed artist for the same reason I can't write with my right hand. Um, so that wasn't the solution. And I was finding that most of the tools that I was using to do anything that like required precision, like eyeliner and, and, um, and brows, um, requires these tiny little tools, right? And, and little pencils and a tight grip. And even without having some issues with grip and stability, that's not ideal for having a nice controlled application. So I thought, well, what if we can start looking at ways to make it a softer hold, right? So that's where, so those were eyeliners and eyeliner brushes. That's where the wand comes in. So this is actually the tool you use to apply your eyeliner. And tell me if you can't see, see what I'm doing here. So instead of coming in sort of, which way is this, uh, horizontally, instead of, instead of coming in horizontally freehanded, I knew I wanted something that was elongated. So instead of having to grip tight, you could hold it softly in the palm of your hand, whether you do it this way or this way, and you would come in vertically. So your arm is closer into your body, which already starts to help you get some more control over what you're doing, right? And then when you talk about pencils, you know, pencils are, you have to sharpen them, right? To get a nice tight line. The moment you touch your eye with them, that, that point dulls. Liquid liners get a lot of precision, but those are much more challenging to work with. Um, so what we did is we sort of found the middle ground, which this is the applicator tip. It comes in with your cream eyeliner. I'll show you that in a minute. And then two little replacement applicator tips that come in this cute little, little booklet. And this is actually a silicone blend. So it's soft. Because otherwise, before you know that, this looks like a giant scary hook, <laughs> um, but not. It's really soft and, and just really pliable and comfortable because you're coming at your eye, right? Um, and then we built in, so now you're holding it vertically, you're coming closer, you have that soft silicone blend, but it has a precision edge. It's curved to meet where your lashes and your lid go, right? And then for people who have some, some challenges with vision, which are, I guess, all of us, uh, at least 40 plus, right? Um, it gives you an, a little extra window for visibility because when you come in with a lot of traditional pencils and tools, you're blocking your vision, right? So, we're, and all of these things, the, the, the most amazing part is all of these things are so easy to pick up on when you just ask people like us to come to the table when you're in your development pro process, creating your products, you can see really quickly what doesn't work for somebody who may have issues with stability and grip and you can build those things into the tool and it's helpful for anybody. You know, uh, for the same reason, my, you know, my mother is, uh, doesn't have Parkinson's but she, her hand isn't as steady as it used to be and she uses it. I just uh, have a young friend who's just learning how to apply makeup. It's great for her. So I just, uh, the universal thing I think is, is such, so important and I'm hoping the industry will, is, I'm seeing it starting to move towards it. But anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked. The next point is stability. So now we've got grip covered. What about stability? Um, you can hold this wand in multiple ways when you're applying your eyeliner. The higher you go, the more stability you're gonna have. Now there's this little, see the sort of rounded edge? There's a rounded side and then there's a little indent. So you can see the divot. This, the divot is where your finger goes. That's where you get a little bit of control. If this is the way you're hoping, that's sort of the way I start, I recommend when you're starting out and then you can adjust. And then the other side, if you want to get more control. So instead of taking a pencil and applying it, the moment you touch your eye with it, you're gonna start applying product. This way you can sort of steady it against your cheek first. So you're grounding. And then you get your footing, right? So before I even touch my eye, now I get my control first. Then I tilt the applicator to where I want to apply my makeup. So with, that's right where my lashes and my lid meet. And then I just, and I'll grab some liner and show you. And I just start with little motions and I just sort of work across the lid like that. The more comfortable you get, you might end up to that point where you're just sort of rolling it across the eye. But I think the best way to start is this sort of these slow little motions. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, oops. The next piece is the liner. So the cream liner is pressed, it's called a hot pour, and we press it really firmly. So it'll feel like you're hitting something solid, but it's actually a really emollient formula. It's meant to be pressed like this because when you go in here, you don't wanna work it like you're, um, oh, there's one other thing to point out. I can't open a lot of traditional compacts. Um, I can't, if it's a round jar, I can't get, 
enough purchase on. I can't get enough, my fingers around it to open it. Same thing with a lot of compacts that I just, uh, you know, can't get in there. So you'll notice that this looks like um, a triangle on top of a triangle. And it's almost like a little hourglass so that I can get in there whichever way I go so that I have an easier time opening it. So I think that's really helpful. So I'll get a recording of it. I can send it to you. So the, the next thing is from there is I hopefully I'd love to do. Oh, shoot. I, I, sorry, I did it again. Oh, I was trying to mute somebody. That's okay. That's okay. I'm here. No worries. Um, yeah, so I think the next step from here is we're actually working on something. I'd love to do something where you could also open uh, your jar if you only have the use of one hand. So I think there's always going to be room for improvement and we're learning as we go. Uh, but um, this is how you do this. So let's say you want to start with um, and I, I'm going to I'm going to show the waterline first, but I just want to caution that this depends on your comfort level and how shaky your hand is, because if your hand has, a, you know, we're not going to stop the shake, we're going to help control the shake. And so if there's a lot of tremor going on, this technique is going underneath the lash line into the, you know, into the eye area. So just know that it's, it's a popular technique, but obviously if the tremor is really strong enough, you'll know if it's something you're comfortable doing or not. But if, if you're comfortable, it's a great technique. So when you're doing this technique, you're working with the outside edge right there. And you just glide, Let's see if you can see. You don't need a lot. Always think of it as um, just like a thin veil. Like when you're done picking up the product, it should look, there should be no sort of chunks or thickness. It should just be really thin. A little bit goes a long way. You can always add more. And then, let's see if I can do this. Tell me if you can see or not see what I'm doing. And we have a magnifying mirror, but so I rest, I start at the outside of my eye. I go under and I just stamp that color right under my lashes. So eyeliner was originally one of the, so one of the original reasons we use eyeliner is to make a, the lash base look thicker, which automatically makes the eye look bigger. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times people are struggle with eyeliner techniques because you have to create shape with them when you're working above. This works on every eye shape because you're just following the waterline into the lash bed. Um, you don't have to think about shape. You don't have to worry about transfer. If you have an eye shape that has more of a hooded lid, you don't have to worry about the eyeliner getting covered with the shape of your eye. So this is a really nice technique to do. So I can show you with the other eye. Again, you want to rest. And you can see, so I'm, sh I'm shakier with this hand but I'm still comfortable doing it. I still feel like I push a little, you'll notice I'm pushing a little bit more firmly into my cheek when my hand is a little bit sh shakier on this side. And I get it done. So that's the first, the first step. Now, if you wanna do a traditional line above the eye, then instead of digging in, you're gonna do this. You're either gonna sort of take this, this bends back. So you almost flatten it into the formula to run the applicator tip. And again, make sure you can even coat both sides if you want, as long as, again, you take a look and make sure there's no excess. If there's a lot of excess, wipe it down a little bit. And then I'm gonna rest, okay, which way should I show you this? I don't know where to put the mirror. Uh, and if you need a little bit stability, if your eye or your face has also some tremor to it, some, uh, a little bit of too much movement, if your eye flutters, it's okay to hold on to the eye area. People always say, don't, you know, don't pull on the eye, don't pull that. I mean, you don't wanna rub your eyes aggressively, but if you never moved your eye, you know, we sleep on, then you wouldn't wash your face either, right? So it's okay to apply a little bit of pressure uh, and just give a little bit of hold. You rest and then you just start drawing it across the eye. If you want a little bit of uh, tighter line, you can also hold it this way and come in and just work it straight across. But again, that grip, that sort of landing here, come back in. You can always rework it. Some people find that they have a little bit more control. They still use the rest. They'll come in a little lower, but they're using that resting point. So I always recommend start with the traditional way, which is up here, and then feel what works best for you. If it's a little bit more comfortable to use the resting point a little lower, but coming in vertically, being able to rest and steady your hand, being able to get that, that vision and knowing that you never have to worry about this sort of this shape changing on you gives you the control you need. Again, you can go back in, you can even make a little wing. 
It's just like that. Okay. So that's, that's the island. The lower, on the lower lid? Sure, do, the lower water line okay. or underneath the lashes? Yes, underneath, underneath the, where, wherever you put it, under, okay. the lower. So for water line, I do, now you're coating underneath. So you're pushed back like that. So I'm on the, that, that you, and you can tell, right? Cause you'll see where it's gonna land. Now I just rest it here. Again, I'm resting, I'm tilting, finding where I'm, where my, and then I just, I may stop, turn. Just like that. Now I tend not to use cream liner or eyeliner pencils underneath the lashes. You certainly can. If I do that, I usually take something like a, a shadow or a shadow brush and soften it out so that the line isn't too hard. But if you like it to get under there a little, you can just come under here and blend it out a little bit. If I want to do a little bit of a lift, I can just lift it up like that. And it's almost like you're creating a little extra lash that starts to change the shape of the face. So you can see the difference, right? Because if I, from doing something like this, instead of having to sort of freehand uh, with a pencil or a liquid. And then I go in with my mascara, which I can show you next. You'd like to see that one. Or do you have any questions about the, the liner before um, I move no, on? No questions so far. Okay. Colors. Oh, the other question was about colors because right now you yeah. only have black and brown. Yeah. So we launched. I can't wear, neither, neither works for me for eyeliner. So yeah. Oh, and you asked a good question the, the last time we spoke, which is, so right now we have black and, uh, and brown. Brown came out. I can show you the brown as well, maybe on the other eye. Um, and we do have more really fun colors coming. We get a lot of requests for, for navies and plums and purples, greens. Um, so charcoals, bronze. Um, so certainly we'll expand, expand the range. If you want to use another color that we don't have in the line, um, my recommendation is try to find the firmest formula possible. And if you can't, if it's a creamier form of formula, just be aware that it will pick up a lot of product on the applicator tip. So when you're done picking up that product, make sure you wipe it down, right? Because it's gonna pick up a lot so that there's just a really, again, it's just like a thin thin coat. Otherwise, if it's thick, it's gonna get a thick line. You know, it's gonna get chunky, chunky coating. It's gonna get a chunky line. Um, so that would just be, be the, probably the best way to do that. Um, and then uh, there are some people who have tried taking pencils and drawing the pencil on the applicator tip. The pencil needs to be really creamy, otherwise it'll tug a little bit too much. Uh, liquids dry down too fast, so those aren't necessarily the best with this, but any other cream or gel should be able to do it as long as you work a little bit more to control how much is on that applicator. Um, and then uh, just keep your eye out because the new colors are coming soon. Um, so that's for the liner. For mascara, Mascara, part, the other thing that was always happening with me with my mascara is um, I, I would drop my mascara all the time and I do my makeup, I think like a lot of people in the bathroom in the morning and the minute I do you drop your mascara on the floor in the bathroom, that's the end of your mascara. But also it's such like a, a key technique to defining the eyes, just like eyeliner. And it can be a little scary when the hand is not so steady, right? So instead of a grip, what we did is we created a ring. This is the mascara, so I should show you the, that's the, oh. so it's kind of like, yeah. can you see that? Sorry, my, yeah, there we go. I don't know which way to go, but yeah, there's the ring. <laughs> um, and, you know, the formula is a tubing formula, which means it wears like a waterproof, but it is not damaging like waterproof. Uh, but tubing actually wraps around the lashes so that you don't have to work hard. You know, you very often you'll watch and people recommend getting with a brush and they tell you to get in the lashes and work it back and forth to really coat them. You do not need to do that with this. It, it literally, the formula will wrap. Now there's a little thumb rest. So on days when my hand is really steady, I may just come in like this and just start applying. But when my hand is shakier, I need more stability because I'm hands-free. Now I get to rest my hand whether it's like this or whether I'm coming in this way and trying to catch my lashes, just that little bit of stability allows me to get in there. I really should have a magnifying mirror. Ah, there we go. Now I can see what I'm doing. And again, you can coat all you want, but a little bit does really go a nice long way.
and that's how you work with the mascara. So that's that. Um, we do have mm -hmm. one question. Uh, sure. In addition to PD, this is from Naomi. She's challenged. She can't see well without her glasses, which are off when she puts on makeup. And you took your glasses off, obviously, to put on the makeup. So yeah. Any hints? Yeah. So um, there's actually I can send you if you want, Jane. After this, there's some great examples. We have um, some uh, lead, some some of our our um, community of, of users actually are legally blind and and are using it the wand because of the ability to help sort of guide your hand in the application. Obviously that doesn't necessarily give you the vision. Um, I can't apply anything without a really good magnifying mirror. Um, so I, that's what I use. They do make those glasses. I don't know if you've seen them where one side flips up, but it's not to my prescriptions. Uh, and they, I haven't found one that's really amazing yet. Uh, if, not, if I can't find one, you know I'm gonna make one, but um, you can look for makeup glasses. They're not very expensive. They sell them on Amazon um, and see if that works. My best bet so far is magnifying mirror. Just know that when you work with a magnifying mirror, it's distorting your features. So it's not gonna give you the right view of everything. It's fine when you're working, trying to get in close, but every, every once in a while you need to step back, put your glasses back on, look in a, in a normal mirror, right? Regular mirror to make sure that it looks balanced because I think when when your features are distorted, sometimes we tend to over apply thinking we need more than we really do. Okay, I've been using uh -huh. a magnifying mirror for years and I, I, I couldn't do it without it. Yeah, I mean, there's no way I can't. I, I, I It's just the vision is not there at all for me. Um, and then we have brow. So the brow is a very, you know, the com same component as the mascara. And it's this little fine precision brush. And so you can use it sort of on the tip if you wanna start drawing in and creating a little shape, or if you just want a little bit of hold and, and sort of fill in a little bit, you can just kind of comb through. My recommendation with brow is you're always gonna get the richest deposit of color the first place you drop the, the brush, right? So for most of us, that's not right up here. So I usually say just start a little bit back first and work your color in there because you want to keep the front of your brow a little softer and then come back through and brush it up. And when you need a little bit more control, again, whether you're using, sometimes I'll just even use my palm of my hand to get that sort of that control. Because again, with the hands free, you can find those ways to accommodate. And that's, that's a god eye. Wow. Um... Carolyn says so she received your products as a gift last Christmas and she loves them. Oh, yay. Linda Thank you so asked, much. And Linda wants to know if they are hypo hypoallergenic. Yes, yeah, so all of our formulas, we go through some really intense testing um, for ophthalmology testing, dermatology testing. Um, we actually have our cream eyeliner tested. We, we, the labs do it, but we go through an independent testing facility and uh, we can actually even share those reports, which is fun um, is to make sure that the eyeliner is actually approved for waterline use because a lot of people take eyeliners and put them in the waterline um, and you don't always know what you're putting in there, right? So we wanted to make sure it was approved for that for contact lens wearers. So we, uh, we definitely do all that testing. That said, you know, you can run through all the, 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 the sort of the safety testing and, uh, and um, uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, basically all the testing you can go through, you never know what somebody's going to be allergic to in life, right? Like I had sh ate shrimp for years. I was just fine one day, ate shrimp and it didn't work out so well. So if you know there's an ingredient that you're allergic to, um, you know, we can always tell, we can always look for that ingredient. But yeah, we, we, we run through the testing for sure. Okay. Um... Barbara says she has no eyebrows at all. Any hints? Any hints? Sure. Um, there are products out there. So if you have no, you, you're going to need a base. So, you know, doing a brow gel, even with, even being able to sort of to build in and, and create a little bit more shape with something like this, you still need a base of hair for something like this to grab onto. So if there's no base at all, there's a few things you can do. Um, check out Temp2. They uh, have a, and I'd be happy to run and get one if you want. It would just take me a minute, but they are a really brilliant company. They specialize in airbrush makeup, which has for years only been for makeup artists, right? It's very challenging. There's a little well, but they make a small handheld version 
uh, where the pods are self-contained and you pop them in and they have a stencil and you just airbrush your brow on and it will not move. So if you have no hair, you can do that. If you wanna start with something a little less, um, you know, it's not necessarily the least expensive way to start off when trying with something like that with your brow, uh, although I highly recommend it. There are some products out there from sort of prestige brands and mass brands, and they're called um, Brow Flicks, F-L-I-C-K. And you, you, you can use them to sort of flick and create little hairs uh, on, onto skin that will hold. Um, and a great person to check out how to do that with is, um, actually Glossier makes a nice one. Uh, there is an influencer, her name is Katie Jane Hughes, and she's brilliant. And she does not have, a, she still has some brow, but she does not have a lot of brow. And she does a beautiful job showing people how to create brow when there is no shape there. Um, so those are probably my two best recommendations if you're working with, uh, with no brow hair. Can you put those in the chat for, so that we have? Uh, just type their names in, text, or, or you can send it to me later. Yeah, can I can you. Unfortunately, my fingers, I can't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. My fingers won't do it. <laughs> okay. My mind right, yeah, just send, me the, send me the information and I will pass sure. it on. Do you want me to run and get you one so you can see what it looks like? Um, sure. You just, you just have to see me walk okay, away. Yeah, I'm, getting, I'm getting more questions here. So oh, sure. I'll yeah, let me wait. I'll send it to you afterwards and you can okay, share the links. Um, do you have any skincare secrets that you can share? Ooh, skincare is a good one. Um, yes. So, oh, where do I begin with skincare? Um, is it, are you looking for more what's good for your skin? Are you looking for more what's the easiest way to, to get makeup on and off? <laughs> Mary, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yes, I was just wondering, your skin is so beautiful. Oh, bless you. Well, it's a special <laughs> diet or special cream or face yoga. What do you do to get such a <laughs> I try. I try to keep it simple. I used to, to, to do a lot. Um, and I think it became overload. And so I've really pared back um, right now. And I've mixed it up right now. What is in my closet? What in my, um, I use like a, 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 a micellar water um, in the morning. I use, uh, and that's it to clean my makeup. At night, I need more to take off my makeup. So I have a, a sort of a foaming cleanser. Um, and then I use a, a moisturizer and an oil. Because the moisturizer, I need hydration and then I need to lock in the hydration. So as we go through life, for many reasons, and it happens to us when we're younger too, um, our moisture barrier, the top layer gets, um, uh, gets compromised. And so we keep putting moisture on, and try and, and try and get that water, that hydration into the skin. But when that is compromised, your skin can't hold it in. That's why oils are just a great sort of second layer on top of your moisturizer, because the oils help lock that hydration in and that and keep it there. Um, anything with hyaluronic acid in it, I know it sounds like a scary word, but it's actually based on a, it's, it's a, they use natural ingredients. Um, and it's based on something your body naturally makes that we lose as we go through life. Hyaluronic acid is one of the most powerful moisture magnets out there. So um, you probably see commercials pop up. I think is it, um, what's her name from, um, oh, this is the worst, my, my memory, what was that show with Terry Hatcher years ago? Um, all the neighbors, they were all a bunch of women, anybody? No? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember. It might be, it might be, I don't know. Not old leg. I mean, there's there's several out there. Um, Desperate Housewives. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was going to make me crazy. <laughs> Desperate Housewives. Okay, so Ava Longoria. That's it. Ava Longoria. If you see her face pop up on a commercial, they run them all the time. They have a night, a really a really nice moisturizer with hyaluronic acid in it. Okay. Um, Can you maybe write those down. I, I'm having a hard time taking okay. notes. Sure. Not, it's not, you're, that's what the serums that they have. It's, it's, it's any moisturizer that has something called hyaluronic acid. That's the ingredient. Um, yeah. And I can follow up if some. If I can follow up with some um, recommendations of some of my favorites and can write down all the names. Um, okay. And then send you if you want to email out the list or however you do that. So you yeah, don't have I'm, to. I, notes. I do send a follow up email with with the recording. Oh, great. So, great, great. Okay. So yeah, we're getting a lot of questions now. Um, let's see. What about lipstick, eyeshadow, and foundation? 
and pros and cons of permanent eyeliner versus yeah. your product. Yeah, so um, well, where to start? Okay, so what were the products again? <laughs> Just... Oh, uh, lipstick, eyeshadow, foundation, and somebody asked for a good mascara re uh, remover. We're getting all kinds of things, so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think depending on what you're, you know, obviously what, what kind of finish you like, what kind of textures you like, I do find, um, again, as I've gotten older, I tend to find that um, a lot of cream textures, light liquid textures tend to wear really nicely versus a lot of powder textures on the skin. It depends on what kind of coverage you like. I like keeping my skin a little bit lighter with my foundation. Foundation is really meant to kind of be a wash of color that helps to start balance the overall tone of your skin. Concealer is then meant to cover. Um, Smashbox makes um, a tinted moisturizer and a brand called Tower 28 <laughs> makes it a, a tinted moisturizer with it that's uh, very super clean and it has a high, an SPF in it. Um, and they are, they call, they're called tinted moisturizers but they have a little bit more coverage than what you would traditionally think of. So you do get some coverage. It, it makes the skin look really sort of that sort of soft, dewy, healthy, lit from within. And then I will use um, either Smashbox, although my new favorite is NARS, NARS Soft Matte Concealer to get the coverage where I need it. And extra coverage is where your face actually naturally creases. So under the eyes, around the nose, um, anywhere you might have a little, maybe a little extra discoloration that, that the foundation didn't cover. Um, and then maybe just press it with a, just in, in certain areas with a, just a little translucent powder. Um, so that would be my, my top recommendations for foundation. With that said, with the foundation, if you end up going for the um, Temp2 airbrush machine that I told you about for brow, they make AirPod airbrush foundations that are like no other, that, that your skin will be flawless and uh, there's, there's nothing that's gonna remove it until you're ready to take it off at night. So that's another good one. Um, lipsticks, um, in terms of brands, there's just, I mean, there's like a sea of, of, of beautiful lipsticks out there. It'd be hard to pick just one. Um, brands that are known for lipsticks, Charlotte Tilbury is known for her lipsticks. Um, her top selling color is called Pillow Talk, if you like a lighter color. Um, I think the coming trend this season, you're going to see a lot of um, colors that we used to wear in the 90s. So you'll see a lot of those like raisin tones. Um, and so every brand will have one. <laughs> um, NARS is known for beautiful lipsticks. I mean, there's just so many. Um, eyeshadows. Um, wow. Uh, again, it depends what kind of colors you like. Um, Natasha Denona is known for eyeshadows. Uh, certainly NARS. Um, Anastasia has a beautiful palette. I guess it depends what kind of colors. Uh, those are all powders. Um, there's also some beautiful cream to powders that you can get. Um, Chanel makes a beautiful one. Uh, I'll have to look up the name. I think it's called Moonlight, but I'll send it to you. It's really universally flattering. And they're really nice to work with because it's just a little cream that you can just apply it blends easily and then it sets to a powder finish. Um, what didn't I answer? Uh, um, da, 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 da. Oh, removers. Yeah, I, mascara removers. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you can use, oh, I think Katie found the, I may have found the, the right, uh, I saw something pop up, the right product. I think it was a Neutrogena maybe. Um, so for makeup removers or, eye, or mascara removers, um, if it is a, a sort of a one that takes more, so if it's not waterproof, you should be able to use your regular eye makeup for your face remover. If it's waterproof, then you will probably need some sort of oil base, but you can actually use, um, uh, you can use sort of a lot of the products that we're using on our skin for other reasons. So like, Josie Marin Argan Oil. Argan Oil is a great way you think to use sort of any kind of those, those sort of soft oil, shea butter. Those butters and oils can be used to break down the mascara. And so they kind of, the mascara kind of just slides right off. Okay. Um, pros and cons of permanent eyeliner versus your product. Yeah. Well, I think certainly, it, you know, this, the, our, our line is, is uh, you know, the whole purpose is to make it easier and to make and to start thinking more inclusively, right? Everybody deserves a seat at the makeup table and start to sort of design for those things that make it challenging for a lot of us to use products. Um, and the hope is to make it as universally accessible as possible. So whether you have MS, Parkinson's, arthritis, uh, you're visually impaired, that you can use the makeup. But you know, we have to be realistic. One product is not going to meet everybody's needs. And if you just can't do it, 
then and and you want to get that definition, the permanent eyeliner can be a fantastic thing to do, right? Um, it is really important though to find somebody who is very good at it and you want to see other people that they have done it on because there are people who you can do permanent eyeliner if you are, for example, um, uh, an ophthalmologist, right? Um, and that ophthalmologist may be brilliant at doing it, but they also may not be a makeup artist. Or the makeup artist, somebody in, that may, in the makeup field may have some certification to be able to do it, but they're not really a doctor. <laughs> so you're getting close to the eye. So you want somebody who, who's trained to do it well uh, from both a safe, uh, from a safe standpoint and from an aesthetic standpoint, so they understand what they're trying to achieve. The line will fade. So um, I would always ask for the tightest line as possible. I would not ask for them to create any kind of shape. I, I think the best thing to do is realize that what you're doing is you, again, you're thick, making the lash face appear thicker, which will make your eye appear larger, more awake, uh, you know, and, and lively, and, and uh, which is the effect we're looking for. So tight line, um, and just every so often you may have to get it touched up. Uh, and there's some people who actually what they will do is they will ask for a very soft application of permanent eyeliner so that they have a little base and then they will use a product like our guideline uh, and guide wand and that way if they you know they feel a little bit more comfortable if they can just hit it a little bit just to get a little bit more depth to the line and then they feel like they have more control about how they wear the makeup on a daily basis that they don't have such a harsh line that they cannot remove on the days that they don't want it there. And um, along the same lines, um, Andrea says she has very sparse eyelashes. Sparse. So what do you do about that? Yeah, so um, obviously, you know, your lashes that you can look for, you know, obviously uh, the mascara, you know, like our, our, our uh, lash wrap mascara, or there are mascaras out there that are meant to build up your lash base. Um, obviously the, the, the tight lining is gonna help the appearance, but if there's really a lot of space thickening up, a, a few lashes on their own may not fill in the difference. That's where um, that's where false lashes come in. I mean, you can actually go and just like permanent eyeliner, you can have lashes put on. Um, there can be there can be downsides to that, depending on some people can have some allergic reaction to that. So, you know, I would I would do you know do some research before doing it. Um, you know, lashes are. A little harder to put on though. Look for magnetic eyelashes. Um, so magnetic eyelashes um, are, I, they give you the eyeliner formula and you apply the eyeliner. So you have to be able to get the eyeliner on and then you just drop the lash and it'll attach to the eyeliner itself so that you're not working with glue on your eye. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's, so there's the traditional, the first way that uh, magnetic lashes came out was they almost were like a sandwich where instead of putting on false lashes with glue and trying to put it on, you would get, um, two magnets, two lashes that looked exactly alike on top and bottom. And you'd have to put one above the lash and one below, and then they would sort of sandwich over your, your, your lid. Uh, that's a lot to work with when, with, with uh, limited dexterity. So when the magnetic lashes came out that actually just stick to the eyeliner itself, it's a really smart way to do it. Um, so give that a try. I think that's a nice way to build in and fill in where, where lashes are, are, are missing. Where do you find that? I've never heard of it. You can actually, um, I mean, you go into, um, Ulta is a great place to look for them. Um, you could also go on Amazon. Um, and probably order them same day delivery. Uh, look, I think um, uh, there's iLore is one of the companies that makes them instead of uh, Allure, it's I think E-Y-L-U-R-E. -E. There's been um, uh, Kiss uh, who's known for their nails. Uh, they are nail products, they also make a nice one. I mean, and then there's all sorts of like fancy brands, but if you look up magnetic uh, uh, lashes, you'll see that you should, a bunch of, Google it, a bunch should pop up. I have two more questions. And Stacy, your hand has been up. Do you have a question? If you do unmute yourself. Maybe that's from before. Um, okay. Uh, does Guy Beauty have a lipstick or eyeshadow that helps with applying when you have tremors? Um, the answer is not today, <laughs> but um, I'm glad you asked. Um, 
those those products are are in the works. We're in we're in the guide lab, um, and certainly I'd love like you know if there's products in particular that you find more challenging or you you know a, a solve that you're looking for in the in your beauty regimen or routine or something that you've never done before that you'd like to add in, whatever it is. Um, we have our um, our guide, our sort of our, our guide team at here for you at guidebeauty.com and reach out, or you can just DM us, direct message us on social media and let us know. Uh, it, it, we, we appreciate it and we will res respond. We are sort of at that phase in our company where we're we can be lean and agile and we can, you know, we can we can move on things. It takes us a while to actually get it developed, but um, we're you know, we're only as good as as uh, as the community that's helping us build our products. Okay, two more questions and then we're going to wrap things up. Um, any thoughts about makeup lines that identify as clean compared to others? And we just answered this one about a website. Do you have a website with videos, how to yes. get products and all of that? Yeah, I will and say I though with the videos, even more helpful than our website for videos is if you go to our Instagram, Guide Beauty Cosmetics. Um, and look at, or YouTube, look at, um, so there's a, a sea of, of, of influencers and people who have sort of all different levels of skill and ability who show how they use the product. And I find that even more helpful because it's just, it's very authentic. Somebody's showing how their real experiences. Sometimes, you know, though I love our videos on our website, you know, they're sort of edited and they're lovely and they are helpful, but uh, this way you get to see, you know, even more about uh, how people are using the product. Okay, and then the last question was about uh, makeup lines that are clean. I guess mm -hmm. I clean compared to others. Yeah, clean is a funny one. I mean, we we also identify as, as a clean beauty brand. Um, you know, the, the challenging part with clean is um, it's not that I don't I, I don't think it's important to to be a clean brand. I think that the word is um, it's, it's a little confusing, and there's no real regulation on what clean means. So brands have to identify for themselves. Because clean doesn't mean all natural. Uh, products that want to be all natural, uh, brands that want to have only natural, no, 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 nothing chemical. And and when I say chemical, like uh, I don't mean bad chemicals. I mean uh, you know uh, the, all these companies. When you look at the L'Oreal's and the Chanel's, and who have labs and scientists who are formulating all these great products they use, they obviously don't use all natural ingredients. They make some these beautiful formulas other ways. Um, Credo, if you are though looking for clean, um, you know, just read up on what the company's, um, what clean means to that company to make sure you identify and that's what you're looking for. So for us, part of clean is being uh, vegan. Uh, and if that's important to somebody, then that may not be what clean means for somebody else. Uh, it's just one example. Credo Beauty specializes, it's a retailer. They specialize in clean beauty um, and you, any brand in there, you are, you are safe to use. Every retailer, also the same thing. They make their own rules around what clean means. So Sephora has brand, a, a clean beauty brand section, Ulta, they all, they all do it. If you're looking for some uh, a sort of a retailer that um, maybe takes it to the next level, Credo is, which is C-R-E-D-O, Credo is a good place to go. Okay, well, I am going to pause, stop right now and uh, we can stay on after I wrap up, we can stay on for a few minutes. I don't know how much time you have, Terry. Um, but if you have a few more questions, we can do that. I'm gonna go back to my screen share and go back to my PowerPoint. Let's see. And um, so Terry uh, has offered a special discount for us through the end of November. And, um, oh, I didn't see how much, it was 15%, I think you said, uh, using, this discount code or, or just put Twitchy Woman in at checkout and I will send all of this information to you. Thank you, Terry. We really appreciate it. My and, pleasure. Uh, we give a virtual, oops, virtual TRS to all of our speakers because we can't be with you in person. So the virtual TRS goes to you today. Um, enjoy. I love it. Thank you. I'll wear okay. it with Rob virtually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and oops. And next uh, next week we're going to have ballroom dancing. So if you're ready to dance, with, you want to get ready for dancing with the stars, join us. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. December fifth, uh, Laura Russell, who is an author and artist, will be talking about her 
handmade book, Exquisite Warriors, which is on display right now in a gallery in Santa Fe. I uh, see Stacy raised her hand. We'll get to you in one second, Stacy. And um, several of our women are featured in, in Laura's book, including myself. And on December 12th, Lori Ramig from LSVT, which is um, a voice program, uh, is going to be talking about the LSVT and Google project where they are working to create, create uh, to make artificial intelligence uh, like Siri and Alexa be able to recognize our voices with Parkinson's be able to understand our voices. And it's something that you can get involved in. And then in January, Clara Kluge has promised to bring some somebody to do improv with us. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And then we have exercise in PD with Daniel Korkos from uh, Northwestern Hospital. And I have a really interesting, I found him, this is really funny. Um, somebody from Chicago that I know emailed me and said, you have to watch this video because, and go to like 35 minutes and 25 seconds uh, because he mentions you. And I go on and I'm like, who is this person? And he says, well, I, he talks about exercise and PD. And he says, well, there was this woman I was looking and I found this woman who calls herself Twitchy Woman. <laughs> and he puts my, my information up there. So he's going to, I met with him in Chicago when I was there last month and he, he was very charming. And we're going to have a lot of fun with him. And uh, next on Sunday, um, on November 21st, Shelly and Darlene will be having another open mic chat, chat called Getting to Know You. And they're promising a good time. And we have t-shirts, they're on sale again now for one more week. Uh, the classic t-shirt, which I wear every week is available. And we have a the tank top for working out. A long sleeve tee in this um, wicking fabric, and my favorite the the, the sweatshirt. I love this hoodie. It's, it is the best. Um, if you're in Los Angeles and you want to pick up a t-shirt, I have some of the, the just the classic in stock. You can call me and you can pick it up from me. Otherwise, uh, the link is here, but I will send it out as well. And uh, let's see what else is there. And Shelly and Darlene are also doing a Tuesday morning open mic. And I forgot to change it. They had their first one last week, and I went on for part of the time. It was a lot of fun. Join them. Let them know that you're interested. And that's the end of my slide. So I'm going to get out of this. And I see we have some more chat, some more questions in the chat. So thank you, Terry. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Okay. And let's see.